The ear houses the special senses of hearing and equilibrium. These senses rely on mechanoreceptors. The part of the ear involved in hearing is the outer ear, the middle ear, and the cochlea of the inner ear. Equilibrium is a function of the semicircular canals and the vestibule, both of which are located in the inner ear. The outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear are the three distinct regions of the ear. The outer ear is composed of the pinna or the auricle and the external auditory canal. The pinna collects sound and directs it down the external auditory canal. In the middle ear, we have the eardrum and the three smallest bones in the body, the ear ossicles, the malleus or hammer, the incus or anvil, and the stapes or stirrup. When sound hits the eardrum, it's going to vibrate the eardrum. This will cause the malleus to hit the incus to hit the stapes, and the stapes will push on this window here into the inner ear. Also part of the middle ear is the eustachian tube or eustachian tube. Because this is a closed space, the eustachian tube allows for equalization of pressure on both sides of the eardrum. In the inner ear, we have the semicircular canals that are involved in balance and the cochlea, which is involved in hearing. The vestibulocochlear nerve or cranial nerve 8 has branches that go to both organs. It's going to pick up impulses from these organs and direct them to the appropriate portion of the brain for interpretation. The vestibule is the doorway here. Here is the stapes. The vibrations that came through the ear ossicles would end up on the stapes and the stapes would push here setting up vibrations in this fluid. This would cause fluid in the cochlea to be disturbed. Also in the vestibule are two organs that are involved in equilibrium, the utricle and the saccule. The cochlea contains the organ of corti. This is a fluid-filled organ, and when the fluid in the cochlea is disturbed by the vibration from the ear ossicles, it causes the hair cells in the organ of corti to bend. This will stimulate cranial nerve 8, and the impulses will be taken to the portion of the brain that will interpret this as sound. Conduction deafness occurs if there is some blockage of the conduction of sound from the outside to the vestibulocochlear nerve. This could be because of a blockage in the external auditory canal. It could be damage to the tympanum, like extra scar tissue on the tympanum or some sort of tear in the tympanum. Or the ear ossicles may not vibrate appropriately. If there is an ear infection and the middle ear is full of fluid, the ear ossicles don't vibrate as efficiently as they should. The other kind of deafness is nerve deafness or sensory neural deafness. Damage to the receptors in the cochlea can result in sensory neural deafness. Exposure to loud sounds for long periods of time can damage these receptors. Or there could be damage to the cranial nerve. This can be caused by some drugs. The Weber test is one of the tests for hearing. It will test for both conductive and sensory neural deafness. You use a tuning fork. You strike the tuning fork and get it to vibrate, and then you place the handle medially on your head. If you have normal hearing, you will hear the sound equally loud in both ears. If you have sensory neural deafness, you will hear the sound in the ear that does not have the nerve damage. If you have conduction deafness, you will hear the sound loudest in the ear that has the conduction problem. The Wren test is another test for hearing. This one again tests for conductive deafness by comparing bone conduction with air conduction. This time you use the tuning fork and you put the handle against the mastoid process. You leave it there until you no longer hear sound. Then you move it to your auricle. If you still hear sound, you have normal hearing. Do the reverse. Start the vibration with the tuning fork and start at the auricle. When you no longer hear that sound, then put the handle on the mastoid process. If you still hear the sound then, you have conduction deafness. To look at the eardrum, you can use an otoscope. As you use the otoscope, you can look in the external auditory canal for earwax and look at the tympanum for redness, blood vessel enlargement, or a bulging of the tympanum. Here you see a normal tympanum, and these are the little ear ossicles you can see through there. It's faintly pink. 
Over here you have one that we have an ear infection behind. Notice how the blood vessels are enlarged and how we have sort of a bulging eardrum. The fluid is pushing the eardrum out. The vestibular apparatus is involved in your sense of balance. Static equilibrium is your equilibrium of gravity or your linear movement. This is the feeling that you're going up and down, forward or backward, or side to side. The saccule and the utricle and the vestibule are responsible for this type of equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is your rotational equilibrium. This is a function of your semicircular canals. The saccule and the utricle have little thickened places in them called the maculae. They're hair cells on the maculae and they're covered by this gelatinous membrane. Rolling around on this membrane are little rocks, the autoliths. As the autoliths are disturbed because you're going forward or backward or up and down, this is interpreted by the vestibulocochlear nerve as movement. This is a maculae the hair cells with the gelatinous material and the autoliths. When you move forward, the autoliths will roll backwards. Think about a baseball in the floorboard of your car and how it would move as you go forward, backward, left, and right. The movement of these autoliths changes the bending of the hair cells, and that is interpreted by your brain as which direction you're moving. Your dynamic equilibrium is controlled by the semicircular canals. On each semicircular canal, there is a swelling called an ampulla. In each ampulla is a tuft of hair cells called the crista. Covering that tuft of hair cells is another gelatinous membrane called the cupula. Fluid movement in the semicircular canals causes the cupula to sway, disturbing the hair cells. So again, we have the hair cells and the cupula. And as fluid flows back and forth, these hair cells will be bent forward and backward. Because you have three semicircular canals, one in each major plane, fluid movement tells the body that you're moving rotationally. The Barony test involves spinning an individual. This is going to stimulate those semicircular canals. After you've spun the individual several times, you want to stop them and look at their eyes. Their eyes should be moving back and forth very rapidly. This is called nystagmus. This is your visual sense trying to catch up with what your equilibrium is telling you is going on. People may also feel dizzy. This is called vertigo. The Romberg test shows the importance of visual input with maintaining your balance. You need to stand near something that has a straight line so that you can tell if you're moving against it. Stand near a door frame, for example. You want to stand there, and with your eyes open, you should be able to stand fairly straight. But when you close your eyes, you're going to feel yourself start to sway, and you're going to correct yourself. This tells you the importance of your visual input to help you maintain your balance.